Hannah. All right, so again, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm the studio manager here at Carmel Visual Arts. I just wanted to welcome all of you that are here and all of us that are streaming on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you for coming um, and thank you for streaming. Um, if you're interested in signing up for any more of our demo nights or our workshops, just go to uh, carmelvisualarts.com. Obviously, that's how most of you signed up, but you at home um, can go to our website as well. Um, and the next demo night that we are having is May 17th. It's a Sunday, and it's at 6.30 p.m., like all of our demos. Um, and that's with Calvin Lang. Um, and then I want to give a huge shout out to Mike um, over at House, Eight, uh, House of Eight Media. And he is helping us stream all of this today and posting it on our YouTube. And Mike and uh, Dennis here. And um, this is Dennis Perrin, and he's uh, our demoist tonight. So let's give him a hand, and uh, yeah, let's start the demo. Thanks. Great. Well, I'm really excited to be here in Carmel. Uh, Amy and I were here a couple years ago, and we met Rich when we were here. Uh, and at the time, we talked about some possibilities, and here we are, back for a demo, and then this weekend for the workshop. Um, you probably noticed some of my work out there on the table and against the wall. The, of course, they're for sale, and there's a price list out there, and. I'm giving uh, all demo attendees 25% off on all the paintings. So if you're interested in anything, see me after or at the break. I think we will take a break after an hour. And, um, and that's it. So I'm going to just get started and I'm going to talk. And uh, if you're having trouble hearing, I'll try to speak up. But sometimes when I start concentrating, it's hard for me to project my voice uh, without a microphone. Now, we have a microphone, but it's only for the streaming, uh, so it's not for here inside the studio. I believe that we're going to be over here, so if you can't see right here, you're going to have that, plus we've got a camera coming down here on the pallet, so, you know, the usual demo thing. Any questions before I start? Thanks, everybody, for coming. You have a question? What's your name? Where are you from? I want to put it in the car. I don't give my keys to just anyone. And I don't know where the car is. So she's gonna it's, come it's right out there. It's, the it's almost where I was this afternoon. I'll go, I'll go show right now. All right. And you know, all you have to do is just pull on the handle. Just pull on the handle. She'll figure it out. I'll get you that. Don't worry. I love my wife, but she is technologically not up to speed <laughs> when it comes to cars and stuff. No, but she does all the camera work for our online courses, so. All right. Any other questions besides car keys and stuff? Okay, let's get started. I just set up a simple trilogy of flowers, and I'm just going to paint the flowers tonight. So I'm going to compose them here on the canvas in a simple fashion. I always start with what I call a um, phantom drawing. So I got a brush in hand, but I've got no paint on my brush. And I'm just acting like I'm painting and I'm visualizing how this is going to look and just kind of in my mind sketch it out here on the canvas. As you notice, I've toned my canvas. This is actually a linen panel and um, I toned it with a neutral tone uh, combination of primary <coughs> colors. Now that I've kind of got an idea of where I want everything to go, I'm just going to grab a little medium and a little cadmium red dark, make, make, a, make a wash here and just start with a gestural sketch and just start putting things in place. Uh, nothing committal at this point, just getting things approximately where I think they want to go for the painting. Start to sketch in, scumble in a little bit of value here. I 
I just toned this right before, so it's not really totally dry at this point. So it might pull a little bit off, but no big deal. Now I want to get, as I go farther along, I like to get a little more clarity about boundaries and relationships. And that's really the big deal for me is the relationships. Because to me, that's what a painting is. It's just an arrangement of relationships, lights and shadows and etc. lines and masses. And how do they all relate to each other? I have a little medium. So I use water soluble paint. I use Windsor Newton water soluble oils and, um, and they make a medium that accompanies the water soluble. It is also water soluble. So I've, I use it and that gives me uh, a thin wash to work with. No, the medium does not accelerate the drying time. It just makes it, uh, it gives it a little more fluidity. So it'll, it'll um, flow onto the canvas a little more easily. But it does not accelerate the drying time. Now I also, in my vernacular, in my teachings, I call this the value map. So what I feel like this this phase of the process is, is determining where I think the major players and those players I consider to be the value relationships, where they're going to fall on the canvas and how they're going to relate to each other. So that's why I call it the value map. And that is the intention for me of this phase that's why I consider it, it's a little bit uh, disposable or dispensable in that I don't, I'm not going to keep it around. I'm not going to be um, using it afterwards. It's going to create the foundation for the painting and that's its sole purpose. So. So I don't need to, I don't need to be that elaborate with it, just enough, just enough. Dennis, are you squinting while you're looking at the values? I don't know. <laughs> am I? You bet you I am. Okay. Yep, yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. I want to simplify, that's the secret. To me, that's the secret of good painting is simplification. Um, and so I squint. I gave up on my beautiful smooth skin a long time ago. <laughs> And one of the things that uh, I like about toning the canvas <coughs> is that it allows me to also locate my lights. And so I just take a little titanium white and add it into the mix a little bit. Again, a little medium, so it's not... Um, and I like to grab a little yellow so that I have uh, some warmth in here and just start kind of scumbling in my light shapes. Now it's not about color at this point. It's, it's really just strictly a, a value situation right now. I'm just putting in my values. 
because I want to know where they're going to be. I want to know how to lay them in when it comes time to block in my canvas. Is that a lemon yellow? It is a cadmium yellow light. And if anybody wants to know my palette, I'd be happy to recite it to you. Yes. Okay. Give me a second here and I'll, I'll do that. Simplicity is, again, my number one desire here at this stage and really every stage of the painting. I'm not going to do a ton with the um, vase tonight. I mean, I'll do enough to so that the flowers aren't just hanging in space, but I'm not going to go crazy on the vase. I'll give it some context. But I love that. Whatever it is, like a whiskey bottle or something like that. Yeah. Really cool. So my palette, palette is titanium white, cadmium yellow light, cadmium red medium, cadmium red dark, alizarin crimson, which I don't have tonight on the palette, didn't see a need for it, um, cerulean blue, cobalt blue, ivory black, and viridian. That's my standard indoor palette, Viridian. It's the only non-primary color on my palette. So to me, this is all I need right here. This is just uh, plenty enough for me to go ahead and get started on my block in. Um, when I'm outdoors painting, I don't put ivory black on my palette. I put uh, ultramarine blue in that spot. Just because the light spectrum of light is much broader outdoors. And I don't, I don't really want to use black to deepen my values. So I use uh, ultramarine blue for that. All right, so now that I have this in place, <coughs> and I feel like I have enough information here to proceed with my block in, I want to grab a, a nice, large, um, short flat. I use Rosemary's, uh, Rosemary and Company brushes, short flats and filberts. Um, this is a 16. I use the Shiraz style and it's uh, the longer handle. So Shiraz is a synthetic brush. And what I want to do at this point is now go into my uh, value, my simplified value relationships. So I'm going to start here with my deepest value my darkest value. Just like in most oil painting, I like to start with my darks and work my way towards the lights. I've got some ivory black and some cad yellow light. Keep it simple. Ivory black, cad yellow light. I'll put them in really simply where I think they belong based on my value map that I created. No variation here, just a simple application of paint in a uniform fashion. Wherever I think it belongs on the painting. 
just sort of, to me, creates the foundation for the pain. I call this stage the block in, which many people would probably call their, that stage for themselves the same thing. Are you using more medium at this stage? Um, not, not more. I'm actually, ratio-wise, I'm actually using less because I want more paint now. Okay. So my value map was a wash, right? Very little paint, a lot of medium, thinly applied, brushed on. Um, but now I'm painting, so I've got plenty of paint on my brush. Not super thick, just enough. But in my um, approach, I like to say that if you can hear your brush on the canvas, then you don't have enough paint on your brush. Because I like to say that the brush should never actually touch the canvas. It should be the paint. Because you're painting not with a brush, but with paint. The brush simply allows you to place the paint onto the canvas however you want to place it there. All right, so now, first, um, now, can you go to the palette for a second? Is that possible here on the screen? Yep, it's there. Okay, so you see the palette. Uh, it's a little upside down, but um, I have this first, what I call pile, puddle, or whatever you want to call it, and I've created my first dark shape, abstract in nature. I'm going to keep it there. Next, I'm going to create another shape, one that I think matches up uh, more closely with another part of the painting and I'm going to instead of going with the deepest color I'm going to go with cobalt blue. I'm going to let that be my starting point for this mix. I'm going to grab some cadmium red dark so this will be a primary color mixture In, in fact, that's what all of mine are. And uh, cadmium yellow light, my only yellow. I don't see a ton of this in this painting, actually. But there's enough for me to warrant it. And I'm going to test that now against my already existing value shape and it looks to me like it could go a slightly lighter. I'm going to drop a little bit of titanium <coughs> white into the mix. A little bit more of the other primaries, especially the warmer ones. And I'm just going to paint that in very simply. It's a neutral mix. It's Neutral, and later it can it can I can grab some color and ramp it up if I need to, but for now it's just going to remain a, a neutral. I wouldn't say colorless, but not a lot of color in it. And we're going to let it sort of anchor our painting here. Now I want to look around and see if there are other parts of the painting that I feel would uh, would require that mix, and I don't I don't feel like there are. There's a there's another one that I'm going to come in with right now, and that's going to constitute my next shape. So again, on the palette, palette remains. If you would grab the palette. Can you get a shot of the palette? I'm trying. <laughs> You're trying? Uh, grab it. Ah. All right. Well, I'll just describe it for mm -hmm. you, for those of you who can't see it. So that first mix here remains a single color mix on the palette. This next mix, same thing, independent of the other one. 
separate. So what I'm doing is, uh, there we go. So I'm creating an arrangement of values that will, they will remain uh, sovereign throughout the course of the painting. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go along. Now my next mix, I want to start again with a darker color, one of the blues, black is actually, ivory black is actually a blue, but I'm, this time I'm going to start with cerulean blue. So that, that's climbing the value scale just by itself without anything mixed into it. Did you just say the ivory black is the blue? It, ivory black, it mix a little yellow with ivory black and you'll see that it's, it's basically a oh, deep, oh. kind of a neutral blue okay. or pale blue. All right, so now I want this to be a warmer tone, so I'm going to grab my cadmium red, red medium. So there's my warm red and some cad yellow light. Again, that's a primary mix. This might be a little bright, so I'm going to tone it down with some blue back and forth till I get what I want. And I think I'm going to drop a smidge of titanium white in there just to bring it up a bit on the value scale. And I'm going to start painting it where I see it belongs. Very simply now. There's no variation in this. This is just a simple application of paint, broadly rendered. <clears throat> Again, if I, if I hear my brush or if I feel like my paint is too thin, and I can see through it, it's become translucent, then I feel like that means it's time to mix it again because it's just not, I'm not getting the coverage that I want. And there's a lot of this on this particular painting. Pull out my musical analogy soon. Any musicians in the audience? No. <laughs> Not one? Come on. Nobody? Nobody took piano when they were a kid? <laughs> but I mean... Well, no. Okay. <laughs> We're good. All right. All right. So anyway, you have some basic understanding of music, maybe a little music theory. No? Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Basic. Try it. Try it. What do you want to say? Well, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> I'll be there soon. I'm just. I'm just. You know, setting the stage. How's that? Now, what I'm doing, I mean, obviously, with this last, this last area that I started painting here, you can see that I'm not just painting flowers against a background. In fact, I don't even like to use the word background. I'm painting relationships. These are all just relationships. Everything on this whole painting is an arrangement of relationships. And they are defined primarily by value. That means that when I see 
values that have common ground, then I paint them <coughs> together. I don't separate them. That's in the beginning, of course. What that does is it allows me to create a painting that is a painting of light and shadow and relationships, not a painting of things. I like to say in all my classes, you can't paint things. Nobody has ever actually painted a rose. So once you understand that initially, then you can get over that right away and then you can start really painting. And so that's why you see me just painting out whole swaths of the canvas. And I've got to make some more music here. Got to mix a whole register. Now, you can see I'm not super precise here with matching what has come before. I just want to be in the ballpark. So if I'm slightly cooler, I'm slightly warmer, whatever, it's okay. I'm just, I just want to be in the ballpark. That's it. Once I'm in the ballpark, then I guess that's a sports analogy. Huh? Um, <laughs> Once I'm in a ballpark, then I can manipulate the paint any direction I want to. But it's getting that paint down onto the canvas and those big, simple shapes in the so-called so ballpark that is, to me, crucial to get the effect that I'm looking for. And the shapes are abstract in nature, right? I can't really put a name to any of these shapes. They're just abstractions. Now, I'm going to get in here with that value, but I'm going to tip it just a slight bit to match kind of what's going on there. I don't want to alter its value. I just want to tip it in the, in the direction of the color that I'm working with. Here. So a little peachy. Maybe not peachy enough, but I'll get there. Simplicity. That's what I'm after. Okay. You can, if you can grab a picture of the palette again. So now you see three distinct piles, if you will. That's my terminology, but I've heard people call them puddles or whatever. And they represent three distinct values that are reflected in the painting. So to me, this is the painting. Everything here has a one-to-one -one correspondence to the painting. That way, when I go back into the painting and try to refine it, refine these shapes, I don't have to reinvent them. I already have them. And they become baseline for me to further refine the painting. Now, uh, at this stage, I'm going to clean the palette and get rid of some of those darker colors that are embedded in my paints here because I want to go towards the light now. I want to get into the lights. And I don't want any unexpected dark color to appear and muddy up my lights. I want my lights to be clean. So I typically, and I think in this case, will stay with my usual um, approach of dividing my lights into two. One is a cooler and not so light light, 
and the other is a warmer, very light light. So instead of starting with one of these darker colors, now I'm going to start with white and make that mix. This is sort of like at the paint store when you go to get your paints mixed and you pick out your swatch and you bring it to the technician and if it is a deep tone like an eggplant or a deep rose color or something like that they will go it will reach up on the shelf and grab a deep mixing base and then they'll add the tints to it and those tints will eventually uh, have them arrive at that color that you handed them. So they start with a deep tone and then they add the tints to get what they want. My principle here is similar. Started with a deep tone for the darker values, but now I'm in the white. The lights at the paint store, they grab a gallon or a quart or whatever it is of white mixing base and then add the tints to that. Because if you start with these deeper colors and then just try to add white to it to try to get it up there in value, it just won't get there. It's going to take a, a colossal effort and, and it'll never actually happen. It'll be so muddy and um, it just it just won't get it won't get you where you want to go. It'll just be uh, a mess. So starting with white and then backing the white down by adding a little cerulean blue and a little bit of uh, cadmium red dark and a little cadmium yellow light. Let me let me see how that looks here. Yeah. Okay. So that gets me pretty close to what I want. So I just lay that in again, very simply, right where I expect it to be based on my value map. I stay with my big brush because that just automatically ensures that I'm going to be simple and I won't get hung up on details prematurely. And just like in the other shapes, I just want to go wherever they will take me and apply them in as simple a fashion as I can get away with. That's kind of what I do. Try to simplify it to the max. Temperature. Oh, okay. Cad red dark is a cooler red, okay. and I wanted a cooler mix. So to me, the reds, back and forth, are all about temperature, not, not necessarily value. I know there's a value difference, but to me, it's, a, it's more about temperature than it is um, value with the reds. Do you ever mix your palette before you start? No, I don't. And I get that question a lot. And one of the reasons why, who asked that question? You did? One of the reasons why is I want to be as in the moment and intuitive as I possibly can. If I pre-mix everything, I take away the opportunity to see a relationship in a fresh way as I'm going through the painting. That's why I start with the dark and then I compare the next one to it on the canvas 
and so forth. And frankly, the way things look on the palette aren't always the way they look exactly on the canvas. So I want the look on the canvas to be the one that I'm more concerned with. Now, one more mix and out comes the music. I like to say that the palette is like your instrument and the painting is like your music. So the more commands you have over your instrument, the better the music will be. So if you really want to master the music, master your palette. Make sure your palette is clean and disciplined and you understand where everything is. And, um, and I can tell you that this part will be so much easier if you do that. Now, one last mix, starting with titanium white. There's not much of this on there, but there's enough to warrant it. A little bit of cad yellow light and a touch of cad red medium. Remember, I'm going for warmth now. And that's it, no blue on this mix. And I want warmth. I really want to see the warmth in this mix so I can understand the relationship within the light. Like the light isn't all just the same. There's a huge difference within the light. I'm going to tip this just a smidge in that kind of peachy direction for this <coughs> last place right here. Get that down. And there's my block in. So now the canvas is covered and I have, a, I have reached the stage that I now call refinement. Now, can we go back to the palette for a second? Five distinct piles, each with their own value range. Let's call this the bass, the baritone, tenor, alto, and soprano. There. Now, just like in a five-part choral piece or any kind of musical piece that has more than one voice to it, each part has a range that they sing in. The basses sing from whenever to here, and they don't sing up in the upper registers and each part sings within their register so that the sound has this coherent, unified, harmonious um, quality to it. And I feel that paintings are very similar. If you limit the values, the ranges of the values, and you maintain those, those limitations or those ranges throughout the course of the painting, the product at the end is a painting that is not only accessible, like you can really see it and understand it, but it has uh, a, a harm, an internal harmony to it that um, is hard to achieve when you have values all over the place, okay? Now, before I start refinement, what's the time? 7.14. Okay, so... 8.30. 8.30. Yeah. Well, I'm, oh, I'm not quite happy. <laughs> Give me every well, second of this. You and you started me. No. I did. You I started you a little later. Right? You did. You did. A genius circle. <laughs> right. <laughs> she's, she's relentless. Okay. Refinement. Uh, first, clean the palette. Got to know where you are on the palette. Might even grab a little bit more paint there. How many of you 
keep your palate organized like that. Okay. It gets chaotic. It gets chaotic. Huh? Starts that way, but yes. well, it's kind of natural for it to begin to break down because you know that isn't really divided into simple shapes the way I did. That's arbitrary, but it is very helpful to at least get started that way and try to maintain those relationships throughout the course of the painting. So um, the biggest thing I see people do when painting, especially from life, is starting to lose those value relationships as they go into the re refinement, excuse me, of the painting. So now, once I start refining, it's time for me to go back through and kind of clean up all those shapes with a little bit smaller brush. So I have a 12 now, and um, I want to try to stay with this 12 as long as I can so that I stay very simple. What and was the first size? 16. It, that's in the rosemary, you know. I mean, they vary sometimes. Different different companies have different sizes. But when, what I want to do at this point is just try to keep refining not just the color and not just the value, but also the, the spatial relationship. How do they all piece together? It's like a puzzle, you know? All these different shapes piece together and form uh, an image. You might even say it looks kind of like a poster because it, it's simple in that way. It doesn't have a lot of variation. So this is, uh, even though I'm, I'm painting at this point, in a sense I'm still drawing because I'm refining those relationships too. I didn't just do a drawing and then color it in. I'm continually refining all the ins and outs of all the various shapes. But I have this pile down here to refer to. Now one thing about this stage is I'm, I'm a little freer now to play with color and temperature and even value because if, if you go back to the musical analogy, I don't, if I'm, if I'm a bass, I don't just sing one single note throughout the whole song. Actually, you might, but most songs you wouldn't. Or if I'm a baritone, you're going to have some variety in where you sing. And that's sort of what's going on here, too. Variety in where the, how the music plays out. So all the different shapes within the painting will have variety within them, but they will still maintain those boundaries of the values, even though they might get a little unclear as the painting starts to unfold. I'm going to concentrate more right now on the flowers themselves, that part of the painting anyway. and start to look for ways to stay within the, the value shapes and yet find nuance and separation between the parts of it.
Dennis, does Rosemary and Co. have your brushes? Yes. Okay, I thought so. They do. They have a set of Dennis Perrin brushes that are exactly the ones I use for all my paintings. I do add a couple of larger brushes for larger paintings, but um, yeah, they do. Can ask. I mean, I can answer questions, but it's, I'm trying to move along because I can sense the pressure coming from certain sectors of the audience. <laughs> Or I could go have some wine. <laughs> <laughs> 
you go have some wine and get to know you can do both I could do both I, in Italy that's in Italy that's what we did all day we just drank wine painted so um Give me two more minutes. But I'm going to start back painting whether you're in your seats or not. After what? Like any good teacher should do. <laughs> take five minutes? No. Uh, I'll give you seven minutes. But oh, I'm so generous. Seven. I mean, seven, yeah. Seven. How's that? Does it work for you? kind of a good stopping place. Okay, seven minutes.
do not I do not think petals ever. I think just shapes, abstract shapes. All about relationships, all about shapes, relationships, shapes, shapes, relationships. That's it. Temperature. I studied at the New Orleans Academy of Fine Art back in the 80s. Remember the 80s? Yes, I do. Unfortunately. Not really. This was the early 80s, too. Definitely not. And I also studied, you know, on my own, um, after I left there, the painters I loved, the styles that I loved. And what would those be? How about you guess? Come on. What do you think? Of course. Sergeant. Absolutely. Sergeant. My main man. I studied with him for years. Um, Sergeant Soroya, Zorn, um, Edmund Tarbell, Frank Benson, all those guys. Um, not really because they're gorgeous. Yeah, they're gorgeous. I think some of them. Okay, so this is a white O'Hara. Okay. These two, I'm not sure. Yeah, they're gorgeous. Yeah, they're gorgeous. This place was amazing. They had so many different flowers that I could just. It was like they turned me loose. Uh, you know. Kid in a candy shop. I went to, I went to Watsonville. Um, Pajaro. Pajaro. Pajaro Valley something, I, something like that. Yeah, I got. I, you know, I did a Google search, and um, I called one place, and they said, "Well, we don't really grow those, but this place does." And they told me about them, and I went there. And, l and let me say that it was, it didn't look like a place that you'd kind of want to get out of your car. But, <laughs> but it, and it was hard to tell, um, it was really hard to tell whether you were in the right place or not, you know, I mean. It wasn't like a it, Yeah, wow. but it was fine. It was fine. I was really feeling weird sitting in the car. So you were looking for the Yes, I, I really wanted the garden rose, and so that's why I um, that's why I went that direction. That's why I called. And, 
Yeah, they're really beautiful. Normally for workshops, I order roses online. There's a place I order um, and get roses delivered, and they are great. And they they come from South America, Ecuador. Ecuador, yep. But um, I just thought I'm in California. I, I, they grow roses here. There, there's got to be a grower somewhere near Carmel. Um, and so I took a chance and didn't order the others and called and sure enough. And 90% of that rose grower has been replaced by the... Um, yeah, I, I'm aware of that. You mean they found a more profitable product? Yeah. Yeah. We were just there. It's big. Value yeah. and the really someone said there's so much dust. That's why yeah. I spoke up. Well that's uh, you know, that also comes from that music thing where you the depth. Um, yeah, think about music and, and the depth of the music and how you can hear the basses and you can hear the you know, the different voices because they're not singing over each other. They're not it's coherent, not incoherent. Sure. I'm thinking about transitions, edges, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, absolutely. All that's in the mix. In fact, there's, everything's in the mix at this point because I'm in the refinement stage. When you say you're hearing voices, are you literally like thinking in the tone that you're talking about? Um, I'm not that literal with it. <laughs> I don't have synesthesia. Is it called synesthesia? No, I don't think I do. i tell you what I do, though. I do listen to the roses, because the roses, if you can quiet your mind down and just pay really close attention to them, they will speak. They will actually say, of course, maybe I'm imagining it, but um, they will tell me, you know, look over here. Uh, you forgot this part. Uh, Paint me, don't forget me, you know. But that's, that takes a really quiet, you really have to quiet your mind. Uh, no, I, I usually do. I usually have music on. I can, by quiet mind, I mean a mind that's not contradicted, not a mind that's necessarily quiet by op, uh, auditory standards, just not contradicting. No, it really isn't. 
pretty much the same. Yeah. And it is oil paint. Do you, oh, do you um, varnish after it dries? If necessary. Mm -hmm. How do you determine? Uh, because if it has matted areas that, you know, lost their, their sheen or their, their, glow, their glow, gloss, the word I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, otherwise I don't varnish. I only do it if I need to. Now, actually, after a long time, if I still have the painting, I'll probably varnish it um, just for protection's sake. Uh, yes, they do not lose anything in drying. They're very accurate in their drying. They're very good paint. I, I have to say, I've really enjoyed using the water solubles. Why did you switch? Um, mostly health considerations. I felt like I was being impacted by uh, constant exposure to solvents and mm -hmm. I just started feeling I, I started feeling a little uncomfortable and then I had some confirmation come from a, somebody and uh, I decided that it was time. I had been feeling it for a while so. Uh, when I first switched, I really had a hard time with the paint because I was used to using um, liquid. And so, you know, liquid would dry overnight and, and it would allow me to put the paint on nice and juicy. And, I, and it was kind of stiff and I thought, wow, I mean, this is not good. I'm not sure this was the right move. But then... I discovered the medium, which I now use, and the medium just made it so easy. What's that called? It's called painting medium. I know. It's water, water is, and it's made it's by wind. Just water? It's not just water. No, I don't just use water. No, just like you, it's probably not a great idea to paint with just turf or mineral spirits. It's a good idea to have a little. Uh, oil in your medium and oh I think it probably is yeah but it wasn't just the liquid it was all the solvents to clean up with and everything. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to another flower here in just a second yeah that one's pretty perfect mm -hmm. you think Mm -hmm. It's saying, stop painting me now. Yeah. Did it say that? Hello. You know, Hello. people were talking. Hello. People were talking. I couldn't hear the flower. Beat me, beat me. Yeah, the one on top is feeling very left out right now. Yeah. Not for long. Not for long. We'll go there now. And then I'll revisit everything. Oh, I did. Thank you. <laughs> Past your bedtime, huh?
Well, only if you think of them as roses or... The thing is, if you look at a rose and it looks too beautiful to you, it'll intimidate you. That's why you got to stay in the um, abstract world where there are no names, there's no definitions, there's no beauty, there's no any of that stuff. It's just there. When you're in the abstract world, everything is the same. And it's easier to paint from that place. being timed? You notice I'm still using the 12, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll try to go like as far as I can possibly go um, with the bigger brushes because it just keeps me, you know, naturally simple. I just, it's, it just makes it easy to stay that way. I have them. They're there. I like the sculptural look of the bright. Um, you know, the brush stroke is very um, geometric and like a chisel. chisel, yeah, I love that. And you can like just almost sculpt. And yet it's so soft at the same time. It, it can be. Yeah. Do you use the same brushes in your landscape that you have? I do. I do everything. I, I, yeah. I don't really vary my method or technique by subject. Every, I do basically the same approach no matter what the subject is. Excuse me? What, what are the filberts called in the rosemary and coat? And are they, what kind of, um, are they synthetic? Or synthetic? Yeah, it's all the same. This is all the same brush and the same film. These are called Shiraz and they're synthetic. And I, I started using synthetics even before I started with the water solubles because I, I just love the way they held their shape and the way they... Does it sound like our car? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time it happens, I always, always think it's my own car. Yeah, it sounds like mine. And I go to that window and 
I don't think that's our car. I don't think it's our car. It doesn't even sound like it's coming. <laughs> it sounds like it's coming from a different yeah, direction. <laughs> yeah, maybe Rosetti wants somebody to come. <laughs> It's over now. So another musical analogy, this is actually a, a recent development, is um, so if you play an instrument, regardless of the instrument, there's different components to um, when you play a note. So when you first start playing a note, that's called an attack. And so there's different ways you can vary the attack. Sometimes the attack can be abrupt and, and, um, and quick out of the gate, almost staccato-like, and then sometimes it can be soft and subtle and slowly rise. Uh, so you can vary that. There's also the um, how you sustain the note, and then there's the, what's it called? <coughs> the, no, the, the, the finish. Hang on, I'll, I'll think of it. No, it's not it. Yes. The release. The release. And, well, good thing I did, because I'm the one who brought it up. But, um, So you see the release, like sometimes you can see some of my strokes, I push into the paint and I stay, I stay in there and sometimes it's just a little flick right across the top. Um, so you can vary, there's so much you can do to create different effects using those ideas, those attack and release principles and how you sustain and all that stuff. It's all mixed up in there. But anyway, it all comes from the simplicity. If you are if you create that simplicity to begin with, so everything is simple and you understand where it is and how everything relates to each other, then you can bring it to bear all these different techniques that I'm talking about with the attack and release and the pressure of your brush and you know all that kind of stuff but if you don't have the simplicity then none of that stuff is going to even matter because it's not going to register you have to have the simplicity in place first She's a plant, by the way. <laughs> In case you hadn't figured that out. No, I am not. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you the word pedal is not in my brain. The word pedal doesn't I don't even, I, I couldn't even tell you what's a pedal and what's not a pedal or any of that. It's just not there. I'm so not are you even. thinking of light flow? Yeah, I'm thinking of the flow of the light. Yep. Yeah, because it looks like, 
But I, I'm really just trying to be observant at this point, you know. I kind of got all that flow of the light stuff going in the beginning when I set it up and did the block in. And now I'm just trying to observe all these, this, this nuance. I mean, flowers are, if they're anything, they're nuance and poetry. And so I'm just trying to get a handle on that and render it as faithfully as I can do it. And that's about it. I haven't. I haven't. Um, I'm well aware that there are several, and um, and I know they're all probably some of them are probably better than others. But I just, you know, I started with these, and at this point, it's been if it ain't broke, why fix it, um, kind of thing. Windsor Newton. Windsor Newton. They call it um, artisan. I tried them and didn't like them, but I didn't use the medium. Yeah, I've got to use. Yeah. Because I've heard the same thing from yeah. other people that said they tried them, didn't like them, but and I said I would say the same thing. I tried them and didn't like them either until I started using the medium, and then. I really like them, so. And I've been using them probably as long as anybody has been using them. And you have no problem with them going in airplanes that way? Well, no. Yeah. They're not combustible. Uh, I'm assuming it's made out of uh, resin, oil, and um, some sort of solvent, but not a harsh solvent. I don't, I, honestly, I don't know. It's sort of like I. It works. We have no idea what's in it. Works. <laughs> On the, it does not. <coughs> Most things, a lot of things, don't say what what's in them. It's not like food where you have to. No, I don't think you can. Oh, I I think you could. I think you could. Sure. Really? Yeah. I just wash them in soap and water. Rinse them out. I rinse them as I go and then just... Some recyclable seven generation type stuff. Or
What? Myers. You used that once or twice, but I don't think you Myers? I, I used to use the master cleanser, uh, the master cleaner thing that, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. Murphy's? No, I don't use it. I think I did. Well, it just didn't work for me. She really is a plant. I'm saying it nice. No, I'm talking about her. She's a plant. I honestly don't even know at this point whether yeah. I'm, if it's different or <laughs> I'm not it's that like conscious of it, huh? It's like you know it now. Well, it's just I'm not that conscious of it because I'm I'm just doing it now. I'm just doing it. That's kind of the once I get once I get that block in finished. So that is uh, ivory black and um, just a little yellow, yeah. Yeah. I couldn't even tell you. Couldn't tell you. Um, I toned it earlier this evening before everybody got here, but um, ideally I'd like to have it toned ahead of time, but I don't always get to it. And I was traveling all day and I just didn't really have a chance to, to do it. So it, the papers that Hannah has for the workshop, that, does it describe some of those things in it so we come prepared? Uh, what's this now? Asking oh. for the workshop itself, um, are you asking for us to bring already toned You don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to. I mean, I tone it right before. I, I, I just dem I demonstrate the toning and everything. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. It's a centurion linen, partially linen. Thing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm. Just I, I got to paint now. I got to get. I got to get after it. I can. I can ask him later and send out an email to my students. Centurion. Answer some of these questions. Yeah, sorry, I was like thinking no, I, here. Thank I, I don't. I don't do well with verbal stuff either. I have to see it visually. So I'll write. I'll write a couple of the questions I wrote down and his list of brushes and. What uh, You know, that's to me doesn't matter. 
You know the best tool? You know where the best tool is? Your mind. You. You. You're the best tool in the whole toolbox. Are you calling me a tool? You're a tool. You're the tool. Yeah, bro. You're a tool. Don't forget it. Anything I can do? Anything? Finish early? No, I mean anything I can do. Nah, you're doing great. Okay. I, I just had to switch off the phone. The, the phone battery died. I got a got replacement it. in there. So. Yeah. I think I'm squinting just as much. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Why? It could just be habitual. Seriously, I mean, I mean, it's like the batter who you know pulls on his gloves, and it, none of that really actually makes much difference except for the comfort level that it brings them because it's habitual. I don't know that I need to be squinting at this point. Who was asking me about the colors in the background? I love to play with the co colors in the background after I've gotten much of the floral stuff done because I can take some of those colors and bring them into the background and it really does kind of enhance. Smaller brush. Yeah. New brush. No, it's not a new brush. Uh oh. <laughs> she needs she needs a clean brush. It was one you have used tonight. Yeah, I I haven't used this brush yet, so relationship. I thought it was a brand new. No wonder you don't want to use the oil based paints. These, these are oil based. Well I know but I meant you know. Well, these I, these have the same. It must be if it has cadmium and 
Yeah, it's it's not the paint. They just put something in it to make it. It's not the paint, it's the salt. It's that, right there. See? This is the big difference right there. Instead of having Gansol or something else, it's water. That's the only real difference. When you have those OMSs and chip and you have to have such good ventilation. Yeah. There's a lot of health risks that come with it. I'll tell you what, a lot of studios these days. Sometimes even oils. A lot of studios these days are disallowing. Uh, Right. I would think Scottsdale does it, right? And is it Scottsdale or somewhere else? I used to say it's Scottsdale last year. Yeah, I don't think but it's Scottsdale. Is it Chelsea Classics? Yeah. They have lavender or orange brush cleaner that's not toxic. Yeah, mm -hmm. walnut oil. Yeah, so I started using those. But you there was... You sleep while you're painting. It smells like a spa. You relax. And they, and they sell the soaps that are like handmade and they're like lavender based and my brushes are very happy. And now I use them and, and they have an orange scented and they have a lavender brush cleaner. But I haven't gotten their oil stuff. We had um, in one of the workshops, I think it was San Antonio actually, there was somebody who had used walnut oil mm -hmm. in the class. And there was somebody in the class with a nut allergy. Oh. Not in my class, but in another one. And they got very sick. They had, they had to go. No. Just from smelling it? Yeah, just from being yeah, around the same it. room. It really slows your dry time really, really down. Oh, really? Yeah. That's why you can use it because it just means it'll stay wet. Mm. What's, what's black oil made out of? Yeah, it's, um, it's um, a mixture of things. Well, linseed oil also doesn't clean your brush. They're talking about ways to clean your brush, right? Isn't that whatever? It's not about the medium. To keep your to keep your paints I just dry. I dip my brushes at the end of every day in clove oil, the brush dip, and then it just stays wet, and then I just wipe it off. So I don't have to use turpentine or anything to clean. So it's a lazy a lazy man's way of dipping my brushes at the end of the evening and then keeping them moist and wiping it off and cleaning them. Yeah, you're going to be shocked, Dennis, when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. Like, he's never I've never painted him. Yeah. It's his first time. Yeah. Yes, my first rodeo. First rodeo? Rodeo. So cool. Isn't it beautiful? Hey. I want you to come to all my demos. <laughs>
Maybe I'm done. It is 8.30. No, is it 8.30? Yeah, just, no, like 30 seconds before yeah. 8.30, so if you want to do it, time. Oh, I don't yeah. know. It's 8.29. It's 8.29 and a quarter. Yeah. 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 Yeah.